first speaker is uh, Yukiko Kuwayama, and she is studying Weda for her dissertation in Gomez, so working on all this in the University of Hildesheim in Germany. And she's going to present uh, about language. The title is Being with and in language, understanding Weda is the concept of and word. First of all, I should emphasize that Weda's conception of language is directly connected to his thoughts on the way of our being. And this way of being is, so to say, at the same time, the place or the world where we are and that we see or experience. In this sense, the, his propositions on language can be understood not only in parallel with Nishida's idea of basho, what in German, field or place, but also in parallel with uh, Heidegger's concept of uh, being in the world, um, in the Weltsein. In order to interpret the concept of Kongengo, um, which is directly by, um, which is directly uh, translated by Weda into a German word, Urwort. Ur is a kind of prefix, um, which means original, and Wort is a word. Um, uh, I would like to make an introduction about the relation Weda describes between experience and language. At first, I'd like to point out that Weda doesn't separate the dimension of experience from our language in a certain way. He defines experience in his book, Wer und was bin ich, uh, in the following way. Um, experience means to experience something and to know how it is experienced while experiencing. I translated this uh, German sentence into English uh, with myself, so I'm, it's not uh, so precise, I think. I hope that you can <coughs> catch somehow what is meant. Um, so this can also be connected to the acting intuition, Handel der Anschauung, Koi Tekchokan, of Nishida. According to Ueda, in the sentence, I see a mountain. It should already be assumed that this sentence itself treats of a mediated direct experience. He adds uh, the self-understanding, self, uh, Selbstverständnis in German, uh, that belongs to the experience itself, is fulfilled with the help of language. In these quotes, uh, we can see an uh, specific interconnection or entanglements of experience and with language. In this view, to see experience from the start as something in interrelated with the presence of language or Anwesenheit der Sprache in German, he can avoid the radical standpoint that, su that supposes a verbal expression can never contribute to the comprehension of personal experience and that uh, defies verbalization in order to protect one's direct experiences. However, Ueda warns of the danger of the opposite and equally extreme standpoint that supposes that language is always there only when we experience something. This can lead to the assumption that language is the transcendental condition of possibility of experience overall. Ueda emphasizes the difference between his proposition and this radical alternative. The latter, seem, the latter sees no room for experiences uh, where there is no language and posits the primacy of verbalization over the experience of its content. As an objection to this stance, Weda articles, uh, articulates his thought in the following way. Um, the moment of language is for sure, or indeed, indispensable, but the most crucial moment of experience lies always in the experience itself. Uh, which means that the sole application of language cannot certify that a given expression systematically attests the appearance of phenomenon or experience. For him, since the self-understanding, which should be retranslated into the Japanese word jikaku, is realized in language, and since the use of language always has an identifying or conditioning character, bestimmende Charakter, uh, in German, and as we usual, usual, usually have only one mother tan, tan, it can never be accomplished to catch the whole or every part of the experience with this moment of language. 
In this sense, you can see a clear differentiation between experience and language in Weda's thought, but at the same time, the experience which I see in his case <coughs> is analogous to a phenomenon uh, appears always with or in presence in Anwesenheit of language. Weda stresses also on a moment that occurs and that is felt or rather experienced subsequently when something is verbalized as if an experience must be something much more or much richer than the verbalized itself, which he calls AX. This experience of AX, something much richer than the verbalization itself, a surplus or an excess, is also called by Ueda das Unbestimmbare, uh, the undefinable in English, I would say, which indicates experience as such is seen essentially differentiated to language. So far, um, I have focused on the relation between language and experience in Ueda's thought. Today, in my presentation, I'd like to propose to read one of Weda's fundamental concepts of Uavot, Kongengo, at the starting point of his thought and as representative of the whole of Weda's propositions on language. Weda cites a poem of Rainer Maria Rilke, um, uh, Rose, O Rainer Widerspruch, Lust, Niemandes Schlaf zu sein, unter so viel Liedern. The translation is in English here. Um, which is also translated by Weda himself from German to Japanese. In this poem, he takes this word O as a representative example of his concept of Uavuat, Tongengo. He explains that this O is not only an interjection in grammar, but also an origin or original font from which the whole of the poem springs. He expresses it also in the following way a uh, kind of sound that signals that something uh, more than just language breaches the verbal world. For Ueda, this O gives a moment to try to segment what's happened to, at all in a form of verbalization. He adds, in the breaking of the sounds, uh, this O, the pre-understood pre world gets broken. He says even, the poet got speechless and becomes himself, becomes himself to this sounds all. That means this unsayable presence, the unsagbare presence in German, leads us to verbalize. Now, I would like to explain about two different ways of verbalization uh, in Weda thought. These two are called by Weda language for the real, jitsu no kotoba, and uh, language for the unreal, um, he uses these terms, kyoto jitsu, both for two different ways of verbalization as for two different ways of appearing of the world. The word real, jitsu, is used for a descriptive way of verbalization. Language, uh, yeah, no. um, here is a quote in Japanese. I translated it into English with myself. Language expresses uh, that state of affairs, but this language or this expression disappears with the appearing of the affairs, of the affairs and goes hidden right under the, under the appearance of the affairs. Let me provisionally use the Kantian term um, sensible world to make it more comprehensible. Here, we could think of intuitions received by senses through appearances or phenomena. But I will clarify this comparison later. The other concept called a real in German, a real, uh, by Ueda, which I for now call unreal or irreal, irreal um, can be associated with a poetic or metaphorical way of verbal use. He explains uh, that in this verbal use, something unreal is, or something impossible is expressed. Um, this is the quote, I translated it. <coughs> this something unreal expressed through language stays, no, this something unreal expressed through language stays always in language. Um, 
this something expressed through this expression lets itself rather distinguish from uh, distinguish more from the verbalization itself. Or this quote uh, must be uh, a bit more helpful. The unreal, das areal, can be expressed only through language and can be uh, can stay only in the language too. To make the distinction between these two dimensions of verbalization clear, Ueda uses a poem written by a small ch Japanese child. This is the poem. And this uh, here is the sentence. The clouds are with the clouds moving, carrying the whole <coughs> occasions of the day. This is a representative uh, example for the verbal use of, for the uh, unreal. Um, of course, it's physically impossible for clouds <coughs> to carry everything that happened in one day. But this sentence has a metaphoric sense that can be thought of as a mind image conceived by the poet. In that sense, we can understand that this sentence says more than what is literally said in the sentence. So far, we may say that according to Ueda, the descriptive dimension and the poetic use of language can be put in parallel to Ueda's conceptions of the real and the unreal. Now, I would like to come back to my comparison between Ueda's distinction between these two dimensions and the Kantian division of the world in two, uh, in the sensible and the intelligible world, Zinnenwelt und the intelligible Welt. As already discussed, uh, the language of the real can be understood as a domain of language that describes one's perce perception. If we think of the Kantian division of the world, it's noticeable that what Ueda calls unreal is not compar comparable with the intelligible, intelligible, intelligible world, I'm sorry, even though it's easy to imagine that uh, dimension of the unreal is actively treated or worked by the subject. So, in that sense, this something expressed in a real way belongs to the domain of the Einbildungskraft, imagination, relies on both the sensible and the intelligible world. Meanwhile, uh, it is worthy of mention that the entirety of Weda's explanation treats of, treats of the act of verbalization itself, and this already relates both to the sensible and the intelligible world. Even the expressions for the real, jitsu no kotoba, um, whose matters, so to say, c must come from sensible phenomena, can unfold in our being only to the extent that it belongs in both the sensible and the intelligible world. Since they, expressions for the real, manifest themselves as already verbalized expressions. This means that even when we can call appearances phenomena belonging to the sensible world, from the moment we speak of, speak of them, they don't belong any longer to the sensible world, but to the intelligible. From this standpoint, the separation, the separation between the sensual and passive receptivity on the one on one side and the pure activity of the reason on the other is not compatible with Weda's conception of world and perhaps even less with its condition as the act of verbalization. From this perspective, the act of verbalization resembles a phenomenon in which, from the start, both the passive receptivity and the active work of the intelligible and imagination are working together at the same time. The way in which the joint effort of the passive and the active is assumed as pre-existent could be a fruitful contribution to reflect on the way of our verbalization, which is nowadays also relevant to possibilities to bloom in the future of var various directions of phenomenology. However, I would like to remark a small similarity to the compar in the comparison I made. Um, both Ueda and Kant especially for Kant, when it's asked about knowledge, erkenntnis in German, that they both have their crucial point in the sensibility, in the form of intuition, Anschauung. As is well known, for Kant, concepts without any intuitions are only vacant or cannot be called uh, knowledge. In the case of Ueda, the question was not focused on the possible condition of episteme, 
he finally comes to conclude that it should be expected to use those both ways of the verbal use. So, the jisu no kotoba and kyo no kotoba. This means, as Ueda mentions, that uh, both dimensions can potentially have both productive and critical consequences when we tend to follow only one of the either. Here, I translate a quote. Uh, there is a danger, yeah, there is a danger that the experience can get too solid and fixed through the verbal use for the real, while the verbal use for the unreal can lead us to dilute the experience too. Let me use the expression analytical language use for the language of the real jitsu no kotoba. In this way of language use, it is tried to describe things, so to say, graphically, trying to remain loyal to the sensual percep perceptions or intuitions, whose perspectives seem to be very distant from the object. This means that the observation point can be set as an independent instance from the thing to be expressed. Contrarily, the way of verbal use in the unreal way, kyonokotoba, or poetical or metaphorical way of language use, tries to come closer to the expressed or felt. It could be said even that the verbal use in the unreal way itself creates images, or better, that those images are born those, yeah, those images are born during the very process of verbalization. Hence, uh, the absurdity of the task of defining what is first verbalization or the images generated by its process can be avoided in this way. Um, Weda poses this in another expression that this way of language <coughs> use means to redescribe the world in the unlimited obvious. So, so at this point, um, I would like to talk about this unlimited uh, openness. I interpret this as a kind of receptivity, but the word receptivity has a connotation of the dichotomic scheme in which the subject and object must be understood separately. So I should probably call it something un undetermined or undefined, unbestimmtheit in German. This undetermined something, I suppose, is something that we hardly focus on that can be felt or guessed, erahnen in German, erahnt werden. If at all, only after or at the performance of an act and that we can very unlikely see or hear in a cognitive way. I would like to characterize it as a phenomenon that does not accept or allow any kind of identification or determination. But here, at this point, it should be asked what I mean with that does not accept or allow any kind of identification to. Weda emphasizes uh, the danger of <coughs> identification when applied to this dimension, which should be but left open. I personally want to see this undetermined something as something that actively impedes us from determining, determining but on which we tend to put some identifications in our everyday life. In that sense, with us one of one sentence, uh, when will we be able to listen? Which is written at the end of a paragraph on language for, of the unreal, can be understood as an invitation to grasp this dynamic that avoids any kind of determining. In this sense, we can also see a certain normative interest from his proposition on language. And now, to come to my conclusion, uh, it's also important to see a difference between the two concepts of Ueda, openness, hirake, and unlimited openness, kagirinai hirake. When he speaks of a subject, or I, ware, who defines himself by himself as his subject, at the same time, the hirake, or so to say limited openness, is set up together. We could also call it alterity, the others, or even the die Welt in Heideggerian sense. Here, the alterity is unknown to the subject so far as it stays as the other for the subject. But this alterity is at the same time, in a sense, already <coughs> defined as the alterity. 
It comes to you as somebody or something that differs from you when you are already set as a subject. <coughs> to the opposite, the unlimited openness, needs no grounds of any subjectivity or center which cognizes the alterity as others. This dimension should not be understood as something that belongs to the so-called non-consciousness. I am reluctant even to use the word nothingness, mu, or absolute nothingness, because this expression, mu, nothingness, can con connotate too much the labeling of this something which cannot or shouldn't be closed and defined. Hirake, this Japanese word introduced by Ueda, um, which has also something to do with Rilke and Heidegger, of course, but in the Japanese form of this openness, so hirake, this word, sounds very much uh, more uh, like an appearance or a phenomenon that has no center and even no order of causality, also without making an impression to uh, sub substantialize the word, too. Um. Since for Ueda, this unlimited openness in which we are can only be guessed, erant in German, solely through our act of language, and uh, th this is interrelated with our experiences. It can be said that he thinks language, he thinks language functions as a kind of web or net with which we experience or get to know the world. Through his view into the processual act of verbalization, where even the images can be born during the very verbalization, we can consider language more as an activity or an ergeia than as an entity or a facul faculty that one possesses. In this sense, <coughs> since the act of language, as well as the presence of language, which means the presence of the web from which we experience, has both a descriptive and an opening dimension, Weda allows us to think that one's way of being is from the start open both to this de defining, determining way, and opening way to segment his worldviews while being grounded by the unlimited openness. At the end, I must mention about one thing. The logic hidden under this, under this assumption, being trying to define and determine the experience while being open to the unlimited openness. This can remind us of the three steps of giving identity to ourselves in a Zen Buddhistic way. I am I, and then I am not I, and I am I. Ueda gives in Japanese an, exam an example like, a mountain is a mountain, a mountain is not a mountain, and a mountain is a mountain. I am now tempted to interpret this as an endless try to verbalize ourselves. <coughs> I am I, I am not I, yes, I am I. Yet, I am not I, oh yes, I am I, or not, and so on. And I would rather like to avoid to use the word repeat, um, even though it has a re recurrent character. I'd like to interpret this endless try to affirm and to negate ourselves as ourselves as such can be understood as our getting aware of our understanding and not understanding of our, ourselves too. And since we are, as Ueda stresses, always open to a kind of unlimited, undefinable, these attempts to affirm or negate ourselves can also be understood as an endless, lifelong activity. This logic is recognizable in Weda's interpretation, interpretation of Merleau-Ponty's understanding of language, which can be summarized like going out of the language, coming back to the language. That means through the cutting or shocking experience of uabot kongengo, we get uh, speechless. That means we get out from language. And through this speechlessness, we come back to try to give birth to expressions come back to language. So, this endless attempt to verbalize from the speechlessness or the unlimited openness, as well as our endless attempts to affirm <coughs> and deny the identity and the contradictory, shouldn't be understood in a Hegelian dialectic way, whose culmination should be an absolute point. Rather, it should show us more about our vivid and unexpected way of being into the undefined, 
which brings us a moment to define and verbalize our alterity and ourselves too. What knows, but never its end. In that sense, one can say that uh, Weda gives us a big hint of a normative, normative way of being in a very open, or so to say, in a very unidentified in a very unidentifying way. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We have a few minutes for questions, mm -hmm. but I, I'm mm -hmm. sure that uh, she's happy to receive comments and remarks and questions if you have any. language of the open, it sounds a lot like um, <coughs> unconcealment right, in Heidegger. And I wonder in what German? would be his version of concealment. I mean, everything can't. Can yeah, I mean, everything can't be open at once, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, you talked about the, un, you say the unlimited, unlimited uh, openness. Mm. How does concealment, do you think, play? Um, a role here, or is there something mm. like this analogous? Uh, I think uh, Weda makes also a comment about Heideggerian uh, concept of openness or uh, world. For him, this openness by Heidegger is uh, um, unlimited, uh, no, is rather limited openness. And he wanted to, uh, you know, um, but this unlimited openness by Weda or of Weda is rather, it's, for me, it very resembles to this <coughs> conception of Mu, or Zettaimu, by Nishida, but um, the connotation is somehow different. Uh, Zettaimu is so absolute, sounds for me, uh, which is <coughs> labeling this something we can never actually identify. Uh, oh my god, please. <laughs> uh, I have this, I, I, um, I have this feeling that uh, Mu has a much more labeling connotation than this unlimited openness. Can it be a kind of hint to answer your question? I don't know. <coughs> I mean, yeah, Mu. I feel like uh, in some ways we can compare Mu to Heidegger's notion of concealment. Right? I'm not sure what this word is. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yo, yo, <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I, I mean, I'm thinking here of life and death. Well, <laughs> and death. Um, <coughs> can, can, in Heidegger, concealment and unconcealment are always always together. Yes. Play, yes. Yes. Play. But <coughs> that itself, yes, has to be opened or revealed. Yes, in a sense. Yes. that is mm -hmm. yes. so. That's the. The, what happens as the clearing or in the clearing. So yeah. isn't that more like the unlimited openness of the Veda, mm -hmm. the clearing, which is the interplay, the, ground the space of, of the interplay, the concealing and unconcealing. That's probably more accurate. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for that. That was really great. I'm just curious, early, early in the, your paper, <coughs> I think you distinguished um, the Urwort from Kyono Kotaba. Mm -hmm. And can I just ask what distinguishes those in, in your understanding uh, of the okay. word? Um, I think Urwort is mm, the kind of uh, Anlass. No, Anlass, not Anlass. Okay. Yeah. Anlass. Mm -hmm. Occasion? Mm -hmm. Moment? I don't know. The kind of moment which you get. Mm -hmm. uh, Spontaneously, mm -hmm. and uh, kyono kotoba is like you are somehow also passively, but also somehow actively working to express, to verbalize mm -hmm. from the experience of this world. Mm -hmm. I would say that's why I would like to distinguish uh, in this way. Mm. Um, Francesca, <laughs> perhaps last question. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, I don't know Ueda, but I found really interesting in this concept of Urwort. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I understood well, Urwort is also something that is not only in language, 
then mm -hmm. my, my mm -hmm. question is, is an award a word <laughs> or not? <laughs> good question, really good question. <laughs> to be honest, uh, yeah, from, a, from a point of view, I think, uh, I don't know, um, I can't now answer uh, what Widow would say to this question. But from my point of view, I think Wobot can be everywhere. You can also have this experience with uh, dancing or with singing or with, I don't know, pantomime, something like this. So it <coughs> doesn't have to be only as, uh, understood only in a form of language or word. But uh, for me, it's very important, I think, that he used this word, Wobot, which has this uh, connotation of language, because he is has this op op opinion that we have we experience things kind of always with the presence of language. Mm -hmm. That's why I think he used this term. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. So, okay. Thank you.